we can begin the opening debate. The theme, a world transformed, Europe in an era of global power shifts. Europe is living through a period of intense uncertainty. The unraveling of the political order in the Middle East has triggered both war and human suffering on an unimaginable scale. The sight of tens of thousands of migrants fleeing conflict in search of safe havens has not only tested Europe's legal borders, but it has divided EU member states over the amount of assistance that should be given to those who are desperately in need. In the East, Russia's clash with Ukraine and its annexation of Crimea exposed European divisions over how it should respond to Europe beyond imposing sanctions. Meanwhile, Europe's political landscape is undergoing a profound transformation. Public rejection of austerity, along with contempt for so-called ruling elites, has fed a resurgent left, whilst fears over unemployment and mass immigration have inflated the power of the far right. Indeed, we've seen that in the last few days in Austria. Elsewhere, global and regional actors jostle for influence in Asia as climate change and competition for dwindling resources risk igniting further conflicts in other areas of the world. So, where does this leave the continent in the revolving game of power play? Has Europe been overtaken by the tilt away from a world that was once so familiar? How much credibility does EU foreign policy have? Or is Europe now a minor player in a series of dramas over which it has very limited influence? Those are just some of the issues that will now be explored in this opening debate of the Darendorf Symp Symposium and in these, indeed, in the days to come. Now today, four experts will each give five-minute presentations outlining their response to today's theme. Once these presentations have been concluded, there will be a discussion and afterwards, you will have the opportunity to put your questions to them. So I'd now like to introduce our four speakers. They are Nabil Farmi, Dean of the School of Public Affairs and Public Policy and Professor of Practice at the American University. He's also the former Foreign Minister of Egypt. Huat <laughs> Kiman, Kiman, who's Director of the Istanbul Policy Center and Professor of International Relations at Sabanchi University, Istanbul. Norbert Rottegen, who's member of the German Parliament and chairman of the Committee on Foreign Affairs in Berlin. <laughs> Constanze Stelzenmüller, Robert Bosch Senior Fellow in the Center on the United States and Europe, Brookings, Washington, DC. <laughs> Welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us on this important occasion. And the first of the presentations from Nabil Fahmi. The floor over there is yours. Where you are, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is this working? Okay. Yes, we Thank can you very it. much. I'm honored to be here and to join uh, with you all and to discuss a very important topic. I was asked to address basically two questions, how the Middle East looks at Europe, and secondly, what we think Europe should do. Given the state of the Middle East, frankly, I'm not sure we're the best to give advice at this point in time. Uh, that being said, because we're so close to Europe, and because personally I'm, I'm someone who's been in the public domain for a long time and, and believe in interdependence, I think it's important that we dialogue with each other and, and as far as we can, learn from our experiences uh, agree or disagree is not important. The important thing is to understand what each one, each one of us is doing. Uh, five minutes translating from Arabic is impossible, so I'll skip a lot of the points I'm going to make, and I'm happy to address them in, uh, in the answer and question part. But first, my own region. The region, and I'm here I'm talking about the Arab Middle East, although it also covers the rest of the Middle East if you go back 10 and 20 years. The Arab Middle East has been going through turmoil of change for two reasons. One, a deficit in managing change uh, because change was going to happen. You have youth, you have communications, and you simply have the changing environment. But the absence of good governance led to the deficit in managing change. And secondly, uh, in a, and this is mostly North Africa, what you saw in Libya, Tunis, and in Egypt in particular. Secondly, if you move towards the Levant and, and down towards Yemen, you add to that element 
the issue of a, not only a managing change deficiency, but also a national security deficiency, the overdependence on foreigners. And that's why you have in that area not only the problems of change, you also have so many regional and, non and non-regional players playing in the change process. That's what, that's the re those are the reasons for change in our region. Now, because of that, you have a number of crises all at the same time uh, that are knocking on our doors internally and knocking on your doors uh, as Europe, and I'd like to sort of move um, into, into, into my advice to you from that perspective. Since I started by being candid about my own region, uh, I hope you're not offended by my being candid about what I think Europe should do also. The, the, the region, my region in particular, will continue to be th go through a change process. So you're not going to have a stable, quiet partner in that region in the immediate near future. But let me also say that with all the problems, and some of them are concrete and tangible, others are perceived and virtual, isolationism is not an option. If any of you believe that you can create physical barriers to hide behind the problems or to prevent them from coming into your region, it's not a problem. Europe needs to be engaged both within its own region but also in the neighboring states uh, because in today's day and age, we cannot solve problems by creating bar barriers. Secondly, it's important that we confront very, in a very straightforward fashion, in a very unwavering fashion, extremism and terrorism. There's really no compromise with those who decide to use force and pursue uh, their, their means outside the legal parameters of a civilized society. We need to address that in a very robust fashion. But the answer, is not only a security perspective or a security response, but that, given where we are today, will definitely be one of the components. But as we do that, I think it's important to caution you as friends that falling into xenophobic practices or a mood of intolerance will ultimately not solve the problem and it will fuel uh, further frustration that uh, creates, frankly, f fertile fields for um, finding more, more extremists and more terrorists. Thirdly, you have been quite humane in trying to deal with refugees and uh, immigrants uh, who have come into your borders. And I think not to mention that would not be uh, fair to Europe. But in that humanity, I need to underline that allowing them to come into your borders is only one step. If they remain <coughs> unassimilated, isolated, not part of your societies, and you're not part of their experience as they live in your own societies. So engaging constituencies that are in your own societies are extremely important. And I mention this, again, coming from a region where one of the fundamental reasons for what you're seeing in the Arab Middle East today is the breakdown of the social contract that exists between uh, the constituencies and those in government. The third issue is I'm a tremendous supporter and believer that you cannot resolve these problems by bringing in models from abroad. They will have to be resolved by learning from those abroad, but also by, de by developing local capacity building local uh, human capacities, and local institutions. Otherwise, while you can solve a problem for a little bit, they're not sustainable solutions. And I would argue that you need to look at these issues, uh, especially when you look at these issues of refugees and migrants. Solving simply the flow doesn't solve the problems because the problem is simply uh, uh, kept at bay for a while. Fourthly, I forget what the number is. I forgot to number my points, but... Uh, it's the time, well, the world is moving so quickly and there are so many different elements that we have to deal with. It, we all need to look at strategic policy making rather than tactical policy making. We need to look at preventive diplomacy rather than conflict resolution after a crisis uh, breaks out. 
or frankly crisis management. We, we're not very good at crisis resolution. Um, and I would argue that it's important to give a particular focus for Europe to its neighbors. It's, and when I mean neighbors, I don't necessarily mean neighborhoods only by way of contiguous land masses. But my neighborhood definition, whether it's for my own country, uh, looking north, east, and west, or what I would suggest for Europe, would be anybody who has a common sea or waterway besides a common land mass, because uh, they are, in, in, in today's sense, uh, neighbor neighborhoods. My further point is, as a region that has succeeded economically, uh, even though you may feel that you're not growing at the pace that you want, but no, there's no question that you have succeeded, you're going to have to invest in the, in the economic development of your neighbors. By making that, con that, that contribution, that investment, you ultimately uh, deal with a number of issues, not only their developmental issues, their frustration issues, but also the, the legitimate uh, pull and push of supply and demand if the mark, if the 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 sta state of, or the excuse me the quality of life is much higher in one area than the other, and we want to really have open societies, you're going to get a pull effect if you don't help create better environments there. Uh, I've already been warned. Uh, quickly on our region, Libya is on your board. Uh, it's you need to work with Egypt, Algeria, Tunis in particular, because this can't be resolved only by foreign powers, but it's not going to be resolved by Libyans. Libya is a failed state. There's nobody there who can really stand up on its own. So a larger Euro European investment in resolving the Libyan issue, working with uh, Sirag and trying to get him to uh, engage seriously with Haftar on the east side of, of the border, I think is, is the starting point there. But we need a, a more serious contribution, cooperation, excuse me, between uh, the regional states and, uh, and Europe. And this is a very serious potential fertile ground for extremism that will affect Europe if it is left unmet. Uh, Syria, you mentioned Syria, or somebody mentioned Syria. I think you mentioned I, Syria, I mentioned in, Syria in the yes. very beginning. It's not a topic that any of us can morally leave alone. At the same time, I don't frankly believe that Europe is going to be the crucial factor in determining how you resolve the European issue. Uh, that's going to be determined most of all by three components. US, Russia, <coughs> the regional states and their problems, and then ultimately uh, the Syrians, and I regret to say it in that order, but that seems to be the reality. But in the meantime, we need to be ready to deal constructively and in a sustained fashion with two elements. One, with extremists and the extremist pull that that conflict uh, creates in our own societies, including in yours, and secondly, with the refugee uh, migration issues. The Arab-Israeli conflict, which nobody's talking about these days, has been the longest standing conflict in the Middle East, particularly the Palestinian-Israeli issue. It should not be, be left undone simply because there are more violent, bloody conflicts occurring in our region. If you have a, a people, the Palestinians in particular, who have not been able to express their, na their national rights, this is not something that's gonna go away and it will come back and bite us very hard if we don't deal with it. Uh, my last two points are the following. It, this is a new world. Egypt, when Egyptians say it's a new world, we're, we're working against our own uh, uh, traditional arguments. We love to say we're the mother of the world. We love to say we're 7,000 years old, and we will give you evidence to do that. But if we don't look at the future, frankly, we won't preserve our own weight uh, and influence and interest. And I argue that Europe's weight today, politically and economically, is much less than it was in the middle of the last century. So it's time for you to engage in how we develop a new world order. The pivot, using President Obama's word, economically, if you look at the middle class, is moving towards Asia, and both politics will move in that direction as well. My last point is, in terms of the Middle East and Europe, 
I'd like to suggest that we try to recreate, recalibrate it, redefine, but try to recreate the Barcelona process. Because unless Europeans and Middle Easterners feel that they have a common interest, trying to convince them to really invest in a common future is going to be futile. But I'd like to suggest that we do that this time, not from the northern banks of the Mediterranean, but from the southern banks of the Mediterranean at the Biblioteca Alexandrina. Thank you very much. Okay, Nabil Fami, thank you. Can I introduce now the second of our speakers, Fuat Kiman, please? <coughs> thank you, Juliet. Uh, and I'm honored uh, and delighted to be uh, here and to be part of the uh, uh, Darian Dorf Conference. Uh, as someone who did PhD in uh, Canada and United States, uh, he was one of my uh, heroes, and uh, we always uh, read him, talked about him, discussed him. So it's very uh, honor um, to, be, to, be, to be here. Let me make uh, <coughs> three points uh, to share with you my take on uh, what uh, Robert said, uh, you know, uh, this uh, panel and uh, to kind of uh, setting up the agenda for the uh, tomorrow discussions. My <coughs> first point has to do with, uh, with globalization, the idea of uh, global shift, global power shift, which, which takes place in the title of the conference. As far as I can see, uh, there is a shift from uh, debates on uh, global shift uh, from west to east, global power shift, global power diffusion to, which is kind of a little passe right now, uh, to uh, very serious uh, global turmoil, the global crisis, enduring, uh, enduring global crises. As a matter of fact, a multiple crises of globalization happening at the same time in the area of <coughs> economy, in the area of security, in the area of climate change, poverty, inequality, exclusion. So, so in this sense, you know, when we look at Europe, when we look at any country, there is kind of a convergence in the sense that all these countries are being really affected by unprecedented challenges stemming from globalization. We are here in this world, in a globalizing world, confronting, <coughs> confronted by these, these challenges. The only possibility to actually deal with them effectively is, is to, co to collaborate, to cooperate, to work, to work, to work together. Uh, we have to <coughs> realize that uh, we will be living until 2020, 2025 in a very serious, profound global uh, crisis. This makes actually things very, very hard. But, but uh, in the next uh, five years, today and five years, this is my second point, all of these multiple crises of globalization were uh, concentrated around two significant uh, crises. One of, of <coughs> and, and, and two of them, and one of them is definitely Euro-centered crisis. One of them is the refugee crisis, and, and the second one is the ISIL crisis. These two crises, the refugee crisis and ISIL crisis, are occurring at the same time and intertwined way, but they are separate crises. When we talk about refugee crisis, we are of course talking about the failed states in Syria and Iraq. And, and uh, we are talking about the escalating conflict in, 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 the, in the region. For instance, when we talk about Syria and Iraq, we are talking about an, a geography in which we have internal wars, at the same time we have proxy wars, and at the same time we have geopolitical power games played on these, these, actually these, these, these countries. They are failed states, they are not able to control what goes on inside, they are not able to control their, their borders. So, so in this sense, uh, right now, for instance, we are talking about more than six million uh, refugees in Turkey, in Jordan and Lebanon, but if we actually move towards Africa, and, and we look at the uh, you know, refugee mobilization, this is different from uh, migration uh, issue. When we look at the refugee mobilization in Africa, because of terror, because of climate change, because of poverty, because of lack of access to water, food, and, 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 and the clean environment, you know, we are talking about also a big mobility of people moving towards the Europe. And uh, put together, actually, right now, a refugee crisis is a very serious global channel challenge. 
challenging to Turkey, challenging to the region, and challenging to Europe. But it is a Euro-centered uh, crisis, crisis. We are talking about around uh, 10 million refugees, and, and right now uh, the United Nations uh, statistics indicate that uh, last uh, year or so we have actually 1 million refugees coming to Europe, and Europe and the European Union, who is totally incapable of dealing with 1 million, how is going to be dealing with actually 10 million refugees in the next uh, three to five, five years? So, so in this sense, we have to actually concretize when we talk about the global crisis and the refugee crisis, as far as I can see, is a big challenge regionally, globally, and, and especially in Europe because it is a Euro-centered crisis. On the other hand, the ISIL crisis, crisis uh, is actually is one of the main resources, one of the main causes for the refugee crisis, but it's not actually a, you know, a kind of a directly related to this crisis. When we look at the actors involved in the ISIL crisis, we are talking about United States, we are talking about Russia, we are talking about Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Gulf states, and Turkey. Except Turkey, none of these states have to do with the refugee crisis. As a matter of fact, they don't want any refugee, and then no refugee wants to go to Russia, Iran, or, or, or Saudi Arabia. But uh, moreover, uh, these states are using the refugee crisis, crisis uh, as a leverage uh, to actually uh, uh, to exert their, their influence, widen their influence in the, in the area. And, and, and when we talk about why these countries are there, why these countries are so interested in, in Syria and the region, we see that they actually are not uh, there because of humanitarian reasons. They are there for geopolitical power games and, 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 and enlarging and widening their geopolitical interests. So, so in this sense, the ISIL crisis happening at the same time with the refugee crisis function to accelerate the number of refugees, to make the refugee crisis much more complicated to deal with. So, so in this sense, Europe should be very, very careful about, about how to deal with the refugee crisis, not only in terms of the refugees, but in terms of a larger regional and, 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 and global geopolitical context. This actually brings me uh, to my third point. Someone from Turkey, of course, maybe I should actually talk about the, the role and the place of Turkey in it. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, Turkey is the only country that takes place at the heart of these two crises. Turkey is affected by the refugee crisis and the ISIL crisis, and Turkey is also play extremely crucial role, at least expected to play an extremely crucial role in the way in which we're going to deal with these, this crisis, at least to normalize, normalize, the, normalize, the, normalize the situation. But of course, Turkey cannot do it, do it, do it alone, alone and, and Turkey needs uh, Europe to actually deal with this, and, Tur and the Europe and the EU needs to Turkey to deal with it. And as a matter of fact, as someone who is uh, a firm believer in Turkey-EU relations, someone uh, in my own institution, uh, Istanbul Police Center, I am also working in the Istanbul Police Center Mercator Stiftung Strategic Partnership. We try to create platforms where we get together and work together to deal with these, these actually challenges, these, 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 these issues. And we, we want to re-energize, we want to revitalize Turkey-EU relations. But we didn't want to re see the revitalization of Turkey-EU relations in this way, in a very underlined, instrumentalist and functionalist way, that, 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 that the, the EU and Turkey get together and talk about how they're going to deal with this refugee crisis, how they're going to deal with this, this, this ISIL, ISIL, ISIL crisis. It is very important that these countries you know, get together and work together and deal with the refugee and the ISIL crisis uh, at, at the same time, but, but nevertheless, the mode in which they deal with is extremely crucial. It, it, as a matter of fact, it's utmost importance for the, for the, for the success. And, uh, and I have to make uh, two points, one for, for the EU and the Europe, and one for, for Turk, Turkey. When we look at the way that the EU approaches Turkey in this context, uh, we see a problem, because it approaches Turkey as a buffer state, as a state that should contain the refugees, not uh, actually a state that should deal with the refugee issue in a humanitarian way, in a way that is effective, in a way actually that, that, that promotes uh, ethical responsibility for the other, ethical responsibility for those people who got displaced without their own intentions, their own, own, own decisions, but in a very security-oriented, in a very container way. 
And then the more actually we talk about Turkey-EU relations within the context of the refugee crisis, the more I see that the EU's position on Turkey is not a country that is going through the full accession negotiations, a country with whom the EU should work together, collaborate together, cooperate together to create the, you know, better results, but, but a country who is supposed to be a buffer to the refugees, who is supposed to be the buffer to ISIL uh, terrorists and ISIL actually uh, uh, for, for forces. So, so in this sense, uh, it is important that, that the EU and Turkey get together to work together, but, but, but Turkey should not be considered a strategic neighbor to contain the refugees. Turkey should not be considered a strategic you know, actor, a pivotal actor to buffer the refugees and the ISIL. I think we should go, go, go beyond it. But well, on the other hand, uh, when we look at the Turkey and Turkey's involvement in the refugee issue, we have to also criticize Turkey, or at least we have to actually tell Turkey to not to use the refugee crisis as a either political leverage for its own interest or EU leverage to actually get what it wants from, from EU fastly. So, which means that actually, uh, as I see it, uh, when, do, when we deal with the global crisis effectively, when we deal with the multiple crises of globalization effectively, we have to establish mechanisms by which we could link together security, democracy, and economy. If we actually uh, focus on security at the expense of democracy and economy, or, 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 or if you actually look at the security concerns by abandoning our commitments to democracy, by commitments to ethics, by commitments to humanitarianism, then actually we cannot create sustainable solutions to these extremely unprecedented uh, present challenges. In this context, uh, we do this conference, let me finish with the, by making one more point uh, about Germany and Turkey relations. We do con this conference in, in Germany. Of course, uh, in this, uh, in the way in which we deal with the refugee crisis mainly and then the ISIL crisis, we also see a kind of a, a re-energizing moment and revitalizing moment in Turkey-Germany relations. And, and, and I'm very, very happy with it because Germany and, 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 and Turkey are the pivotal actors to, to deal with this, these questions. And when we look at the Europe, it is only Germany that could actually deal with this, the questions. And the other European states extremely actually, uh, I mean, the, the way they, they perform, the way they think about the refugee issue is extremely uh, disappointing, at, at least I, I, I could say. But, but, uh, but Germany and Turkey are, are there. They actually, in terms of the bilateral talks, in terms of the way they, they look at the situation, they actually want to try to do something, something, something about, about it. And interestingly, you know, I came here uh, today for, for, for this uh, very important conference from, from Istanbul where I attended the, the World Humanitarian Summit. And the World Humanitarian Summit was organized by the UN. And then, of course, they deal with the, some of the you know, problems in, terms, in, in a humanitarian way. It was the first UN summit that deals with human, the question of humanitarianism, the, the problems of, 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 of you know, huma humanity. And, and from G8 countries, it was only Germany was there. No G8 con country were presented there at the level of the leadership. It was only Chancellor Merkel came from the G8 country. From the United Nations Security Council, five. There was nobody from the you know, uh, Security Council, you know, veto holder powers. So, so in this sense, uh, you know, we got to be actually uh, a bit frank. We got to be, gotta be uh, you know, sort of, uh, discuss this issue frankly that, that, that these people should have been there. These people you know, should have been in Istanbul to deal with, to talk about, about the humanitarian issues and, 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 and the challenges that, that confront, us, uh, confront us globally. So, so in this sense, uh, I actually uh, been, I am very thankful to, to Germany and the German Chancellor Merkel to be the only uh, leader in, in, the, in the first uh, World Humanitarian Summit. Because if I go back to the first point, if we are living in a 
multiple crises of, 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 of globalization. If we have a very serious challenges, and these challenges are confronting us, but mainly in terms of you know, humanity, humanity, then we have to be humanitarian. We have to be moral dealing with these challenges. We have to talk about the right of the other. We have to talk about the, our ethical responsibility for, 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 for those people. But by escaping, even from the summits, uh, we cannot actually uh, perform and we cannot do what we are supposed to do to tackle with those. Thank okay, you. we have to leave it there. Some plenty of food to thought there, lots of material to discuss. From Fuat Keeman, thank you so much. We now move on to the third of our panel speakers, and that is Norbert Ratien. Thank you. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Helmut Anheyer encouraged us to challenge old authority. And so I, in a very Darendorfian sense, of course. And so I would like to start my first of three brief, more general remarks by challenging his authority. Um, with regard to the title of our panel, or the authority of the LSE and uh, the uh, uh, school, uh, Hertie School, a world transformed Europe in an era of global power shifts. I want to put in the question if it's really power shift, which is the most important, crucial, transformative pattern in our time. This seems to allude perhaps to a world of terms and of, to a reality which uh, is not our current reality. In any case, I'm convinced that we do not have any longer a system, a, 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 system of glo a global system of power, that we do not have a balance of power, but that we have entered a third or the third chapter after World War II, the first chapter, the Cold War, uh, chapter and period, and there we had a system of power. There we had a balance of power. The second chapter and period, very short, the 25 years when we, Europeans, Germans, assumed that we, would, that we had it, uh, uh, achieved eternal peace. And now I would say for two years, the third chapter, which is not so much in my eyes characterized by the transformation of, or the, the shift of power, but which is characterized by a new complexity of crises, causes for crises. Besides, I, I would be hesitant to answer the question, what is the biggest challenge? Because what characterizes the challenges is that they are interconnected. You can't separate the Middle East, migration, poverty, climate change. They are interconnected, and this new complexity is part of the new normal and the, and the mobility of the crisis we are facing. So what is more characteristic in my eyes is the absence of a system. Uh, it is turmoil, chaos, diffusion of power, privatization of power, transition of power, all together which we are facing at the moment. My second, and to deal with this complexity which does not stay beyond the border, but which is transnational and cross-border, is what, what is our challenge much about. The second ensuing consequence is that, and the new normal for us we have to adapt to, is that these crises in our neighborhood have come to us. The insecurity and instability, the chaos, hatred of the Middle East has come to Europe. This is, this is a novelty by historic measures. The Middle East has for decades not been in uh, uh, an area uh, uh, of, of, of stability and peace. But it is absolutely new that the insecurity and instability and chaos of the region is crucial for the stability, security or instability of Europe. The refugee crisis has uh, shaken Europe to its foundations and it's going on. It is not uh, to be expected to end anytime soon. So we have this spillover effect. 
uh, in the guise of those who aspire our way of living, refugees, millions of them fleeing their desperation, only separated by the Mediterranean Sea, but connected with the internet. So they know how to organize the way, and they know how life could be. And this is not going to stop anytime soon. And the other group of persons coming and spilling, spreading the conflict of the, of, uh, of the regions are those who hate our way of living, the terrorists, who spread their hatred and violence uh, in our cities and in our countries. The third and final remark I want to make in, in this introductory uh, stage of our discussion is that these external challenges which have started with the violation of the European peace order or at least the Helsinki order in Europe by Russia when Russia uh, uh, annexed uh, uh, Crimea and uh, has decided to use military force beyond its borders in order to achieve political goals. So, Europe is, from outside, challenged as never before. And this is a new historical, political stru structure and pattern we are facing. And at the same time, when we are challenged from outside as never before, we are internally in the worst shape since the Roman treaties. And this coincidence of challenge from abroad and our internal shape is really what our problem is about. The most final remark is, what is the German role? What is the, what is the, the vision we, we, we have to pursue? I think the vision we have to pursue is to, to elevate, to rise uh, the EU, Europe, to become an actor in the field of foreign policy and security policy, which we are not, definitely not. We have a recrudescence of nationalism and state egotism everywhere, and I do not exclude any country when I, when I make this diagnosis of nationalism and state-oriented interest policy. So we have to forge a unity which is able to act on the European, uh, on the international level, because there is one alternative. Either we will unite, we will speak with one voice, then we have a huge potential to influence and to have an impact. Or we remain separated in nationalisms, and then Europe is becoming definitely, is, is becoming irrelevant. Then we are not shaping the world, but we are got shaped by chaos around us. The German role may be a leading role, but I would define this leading role as the responsibility to organize compromise, not to get through and materialize and realize German interests. Because we do not want to have, we continue to reject a German Europe. But of course, as hans Richter Genscher always said, we want to have a European Germany. And the internal fabric of power within Europe has changed when uh, the Euro met the international financial crisis. This has dramatically, fundamentally changed the economic fabric and ensuing the political hierarchy, dominance or um, distribution of power within uh, Europe. So Germany has a specific power which has to be interpreted as a responsibility to keep Europe together and to contribute to forge a, a European capability to act, to commonly act on the international stage, which is by organizing, forging comprehensive European solidarity and uh, compromise, and not only there where it fits German interests, 
but where uh, it is a precondition for European unity, which is the precondition for, for developing Europe as an actor in the field of international relations on behalf of our own interests. Thank you. No, but Rakim. The last of our panel speakers, Constanza Steltzenmüller. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank Helmut Anheyer and, and the LSE for inviting me on this panel tonight. Um, I do wish to challenge your authority and foresight on one point, which is I think it's time to stop this still water business on panels. Espressos would be a good idea. But apart from that, I want to say, I want to say uh, that I actually met Mr. Uh, Lord Darendorf uh, very briefly. He, he wouldn't have remembered me. I was an unremarkable and insecure young person um, at Die Zeit when he had an office there to, um, to write the biography of Die Zeit's founder, Gerd Putelius. Um, and um, I cannot, Lady Downdorf, I'd be very curious whether you share this impression, but I, I, having read his book with great interest, obviously, as we all did, I couldn't quite escape the sense that he approached his, um, his subject in a somewhat gingerly fashion. Um, I don't think he ever entirely warmed to Biserios, who I think was both too neurotic and too much of a sort of buccaneering personality, as many media barons are, to entirely... Um, you know, win his, the author's sympathies. But anyway, there you are. It was a very interesting experience to have had. Um, now, why am I on this panel? I suspect it's uh, because of the role that I often uh, had when I, um, when I was still living here. I moved to Brookings a year and a half ago for a three to five year gig um, as a Germany explainer. And I was in Berlin, something of a rent and army when they couldn't fly in an American. Um, and <laughs> here I am again as a rent and army. So I will uh, try and provide what I think is an American point of view. I know there are Americans in the audience. Feel free to challenge me in the Q&A. But... Um, Obviously, uh, we sort of need to bring in the topic of Europe's relationship with America onto this panel. And I, it seems to me that in, when we look back at the uh, eight years of uh, President Obama, we will say that despite some not in some inconsiderable flaws in execution, uh, this president uh, did two things which were highly to Europe's benefit. One was I, uh, what I still think is an impeccable um, strategic analysis of uh, the United States' new strategic surroundings, one in which globalization has made hard power matter less and less and less than ever, and which has reduced the United States' power in the world. And has, because it's made all countries smaller, it has also made the United States smaller and comparatively less powerless. Although, obviously, if you, if you look at the American military arsenal and its soft power, it's still pretty damn big and it can do a lot of things. Um, now, the other, the other point, of course, was that the Obama administration, despite his uh, recently voiced skepticism about Europe and European free riding in a notorious interview in The Atlantic, um, I, it, from what I have been able to see in Washington and even here in Berlin, the collaboration between the Obama White House and uh, European chancelleries, including this one over there, has been incredibly constructive. And I think that we will look back on this period, or the policymakers at least, and analysts will look back on this period as have been, have, having been one of, the, mo one of uh, the periods in which Europe got its way most often and met an America that was perfectly willing to let Europe lead. Uh, that's, I think, a quite unusual experience. I know it was certainly unusual for people in the Chancery and the Foreign Ministry here, but I think they um, received it with some gratitude, particularly when... Uh, disagreements were considerable, such as on the question whether to insert uh, lethal weapons into the Ukrainian theater. Um, where are we now? Obviously, we've got two candidates, or, or apparent candidates, and I would underline the word apparent, because as we say in German, diese Messe ist noch nicht gelesen. Uh, anybody who's seen the news about Clinton's emails uh, from today will know that we cannot be certain that she will be indeed the, Repub the Democratic candidate. And with Trump, you know, I suspect there's a little bit of trouble brewing in the wings as well. Um, a lot of my neocon friends are so unhappy. One of them recently got on a lift with me and said, Constance, I'm so ashamed of my country, uh, which was a bit startling as a conversation opener. Um, but if, I mean, assuming that these candidates are symptoms, yeah, um, even if they won't actually be in the running uh, come November, um, we have a contest in America now between isolationism and uh, a sense that America must once again lead from the front. 
Now, the isolation, isolationism, I think we all know, would be disastrous for us, um, not least because it would put a responsibility upon Europe to take care of itself in the region that we are not ready for and that I presume we are not capable of living up to at this point. Um, as for the leading from the front, when um, and I've got a lot of friends in Washington who suggest this. I always say, you know, I think you will find that this will be less easy than it used to be. I remember American diplomat friends coming to Berlin with checklists saying, we want these six items to be done by Friday and the next six items to be done by next Friday. I don't think things work like that anymore. And I think a Clinton White House would, would find that. Things have simply become more complicated in the relationship, as has been seen, said here on the panel. We have massively overlapping and in fact not just strategic but existential interests in Europe and its neighborhoods both to the east and the south but they are not identical and the relationship has become more transactional for a reason. So I think even with a Clinton or Clinton-like White House we would find ourselves negotiating these uh, points you know, issue by issue and sometimes agreeing to disagree as we have done uh, with, with Obama. All that said, Norbert Röttgen is perfectly right when he says we are going to have to expect more of ourselves, we will have to shape our surroundings or be shaped by them, and frankly, we're already seeing a lot of the latter, and it's not very pretty. It doesn't make us look particularly good, does it? And so um, I would suggest that this begins uh, with our affairs at home, um, with the stability uh, and the legitimacy and the effectiveness of our social contracts, our economies, and our political institutions. We like talking about failed states in the region. What we, I think, have been complacent about is the question of whether we are capable of failing at modern governance ourselves at home. It's, it seems to me that if we look at the rise of populism, if we look at the degree to which people feel today that they are losers from globalization, even in this country, we have to ask ourselves, are our social contracts, our economies, and our political institutions and processes strong enough to withstand the forces of globalization? And I would suggest that we not be complacent about this, and in fact, that we may have to look uh, not just at managing all this, but at, in fact, becoming the architects of our own countries and destinies again. Um, now, a lot has been said here that I'm not going to repeat. I will, I will just end on with, with one sort of large-ish thought. Uh, we're used to thinking of Europe as a, or, or the, the, the European history as a succession of three fundamental narratives. I mean, of course, European post-war history. I'm not going to go back to the 1400s, don't worry. Uh, the first narrative obviously being peace, then prosperity, and finally democratic transformation. Uh, we, I think, are used to saying that these three narratives have succeeded, and this is true. I think we, if you know, to any of, us, any of us who have parents old enough uh, to have lived through World War II, and I think some of us have, um, and they will have told us stories. Um, and those stories, in my case, certainly, are vivid enough for me to never want this again, and as a reporter for Deetside, I went enough to enough war zones to have seen wars and the, their effect myself. That is something we can never, ever want again, and we must prevent at all costs. Sim similarly, we, uh, presumably some of us here remember what austerity was like in our childhoods. Our parents saving bits of string, this kind of thing. Um, again, I have vivid memory of that. I can imagine it coming back. Democratic transformation. I travel through Eastern Europe a lot. I, in fact, finished school in Spain right after Franco's death. These transformations are a reality. They are, they are formidable achievement of post-war Europe. They are absolutely admirable, and we can all be grateful that they happen. But let's not be complacent here. These things can be turned back, and we are seeing some of that happening across Europe. And I would never be, you know, I'm, you know, Germans are always nervous. We are inclined to worry. Um, but I, I'd say let's be a little more nervous about our own country than we have been. And finally, I'd say there's a fourth and new narrative, and these three still remain, and we still need to fight for them. But the fourth narrative, of course, is I think that we need Europe, and we need European integration as a matter of, not of ideology, of idealism, but as a pragmatic, necessary action in order to protect ourselves against the fragmenting forces of globalization. Happy to expand in Q&A, but thank you very much for the moment. Thank you, Constance Selzmuller. <laughs> some interesting thoughts, but the, the vibes that I'm getting, certainly from some of the earlier speakers, is that we, as in Europe, doesn't really understand how everything is connected. Might I add to that, that if we don't understand, we can't be proactive, and by default, America leads the foreign policy. Who'd like to tackle that? 
<laughs> so I choose somebody. <laughs> Norbert, you're leaning over to your microphone. I, I would add, and then America decides not to lead any longer, but perhaps to retreat to a certain degree. And particularly in a region, as Obama announced in the Atlantic, in the famous or infamous Atlantic interview, in a region which has become ap the Middle East, of which he said that the Middle East is not any longer that terribly important for the US, but at a moment when the Middle East... I think East, we know that's wrong, but anyway. Yeah, but he, he, in any case he said it. At a moment when the Middle East is the most important region, for, has become the most important region for, uh, for the European Union and for the Europeans. Yes, you're right, after he, had, he said that, he has re-engaged, uh, but, after, but after a period of a certain, uh, of a certain retreat in this uh, region. And so I would say this part of his foreign policy was not that very EU-friendly, because he caused some problems, and then he withdrew from the region, uh, and, uh, and uh, I think he has not, not really come back to, to a situation where, where Obama challenges or invites the Europeans to share a leadership with regard to the Middle East. So we have this lack of readiness for leadership and shaping particularly the region, which is very, very important for the Europeans. Sorry, Constance. Oh, well, <sighs> yes, I mean, obviously, I think, you know, it's somewhat disingenuous to suggest, or maybe the president was just having a sort of bad day. Uh, it, it did sound like a bit of a grumpy interview, um, but I think it's, um, you know, unlikely that America is going to withdraw from the Middle East anytime soon, and I agree that uh, the Obama White House made a couple of rather significant mistakes. All fair enough. I can, however, understand a president becoming a little irritated with Middle Eastern leaders, including the Israelis. Um, I, you know, they haven't, uh, I mean, they've been a bit of a sorry sight, a lot of them. Um, and I could, I could understand after eight years someone saying, all right, I am done with this, and somebody else can please take over. Uh, that said, I think that um, if you, it's all very easy for us Europeans, and Germans in particular, to accuse Americans of sins of commission when, uh, frankly, we uh, I, are, are rather vulnerable to the charge of sins of omission. In other words, we have tended to sit back and say, let's watch the Americans drive the car into the wall again on this one, uh, when the reality is that a lot of what is going on in the Middle East is a lot closer to our own strategic interests and, in fact, to our front doors. And as we're seeing now, people are coming through those front doors and we're not going to be able to stop them. So we have an intrinsic, existential, strategic interest in order in the Middle East, and it seems to me that we ought to be playing a much more robust and responsible role there. That, that, that is very obvious. And, you know, coming to the specific point of Germany, um, German Middle Eastern policy used to be divided into, into two camps, particularly in the West German Republic. You were either, you know, a staunch friend of Israel or you were a friend of the sheiks. And there wasn't really, you know, these were sort of black and white positions and there wasn't a lot of middle ground between that. And that has completely changed, exactly. I mean, we are now in a, in a position where I think we're trying to connect the dots um, and trying to come to a somewhat more robust But we're connecting um, the dots from behind the curve. We've been overtaken by events. We're absolutely behind the curve. This is very true. And certainly we need to do more. And I think that, frankly, is going to involve... Uh, I mean, you know, if I knew, if, if, if I could uh, lay out the outlines of a successful European Middle Eastern policy, I, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> but let's keep it on the Middle East for one moment, because how can Europe have a credible foreign policy, given that, A, it has been overtaken by the refugee crisis, but look at what is happening internally. It is that crisis, as I said in my introduction, that is fueling some of the extremism within our own borders. So why, why should the Middle East, some of these countries in crisis, look to Europe as the, peace, as the peacemaker here? Well, I think you asked the question in the wrong way, if I may say so. If you think anybody has an immediate answer to any of the problems that we're facing, that's not true. All of these problems... Well, then let's whittle it down, Europe's sure, credibility. Sure, sure. All of these problems are serious, complex, and will take time to resolve. But you're right. If you ask a Middle Easterner today, look at Europe and ask them to come and solve it, frankly, we'd be, we'd be asking the wrong question because Europe can't solve it alone. We need to be part of that. 
and it's also much more complex. The world has to be part of that. But to give you a, a, a precise answer, in, in my presentation, I intentionally mentioned the issue that we need to have strategic policies rather than tactical ones. If we run after the tactical, the tactical pressing issues, we will end up all over the place. We will be guided by the terrorists, the extremists, those outside the system, or by anybody who can create problems. Uh, the specific case of the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations, for example, even before ISIL and ISIS and what happened in, in Syria, the quartet, the quartet was looking for the lowest common denominator, not between the regional parties, but between the UN, the US, Europe, and Russia. And frankly, Europe was basically waiting to see how far America could go, rather than trying to take one step ahead of America while being a very close friend, and therefore giving America even more room to negotiate. So, look, I tell my Middle Eastern friends, don't look towards foreigners for the answers, <laughs> but look towards foreigners for help but you have to play a prominent role. And I say the same for Europeans. If you think we can solve it alone, you're wrong. I don't blame you for all our problems, but you shared in a lot of them, believe me. But we need to work together because they, they won't be solved alone. Can I get your response to that, Fuad? <coughs> so far, uh, before the uh, refugee issue turned out to be a crisis, uh, the, the ISIL turned out to be more than a problem, but a crisis you know, uh, challenging not only the region, but Europe, and as Norbert so said, uh, you, you, you know, refugee and, uh, you know, the extremism or terror get together and, yeah. and, and coincided. Of course, a number of crucial mistakes have been made by, by, by Europe. It, they could actually revitalize the Barcelona process. They could actually, for instance, as Zbigniew Brzezinski suggested, they could have a strategic choice to uh, strengthen their, their relations with Europe and, and Turkey. Maybe if Turkey-EU relations got better, then we might actually have a better position right now, you know, in, the, in the, uh, dealing with it. But, uh, but uh, interestingly, we are actually uh, in a situation where it is very, very difficult to deal with these problems. For instance, uh, the refugee problem cannot be solved. Either we establish uh, states in uh, Syria and Iraq, than uh, Libya, than Sudan, and, and Somalia. As a matter of fact, European Union is a post-nation state you know, structure, whereas right now we are going back to Westphalia because we are talking about what Huntington was talking about during the you know, 70s, the need to establish state order and stability before democracy. So everybody is talking about state order and stability because we have an extremely serious humanitarian a problem, but but on the other hand, uh, you know, uh, to actually sound pessimistic uh, should not be conceived as like we are in a situation where we cannot do anything. I think we could do a number of a number of things. For instance, if uh, Germany and Turkey, if, if 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 EU and Turkey get together and look at the refugee issue, not in a buffer state uh, mode not the instrumentalist vote, but, but in a kind of a humanitarian mode in which we could actually bring together security issues, economic issues, and, and, and democracy issues. That means if the EU looks at Turkey without abandoning uh, the, the, the problem and the question of democracy in Turkey, then of course uh, we might get a, a you know, uh, sort of a way out. Let me say one more thing about this. Uh, for instance, uh, if uh, we approach Turkey as a buffer state, as a container to refugees and the ISIL without talking about internal democratization problem in Turkey, then uh, we are also a mistake in terms of the refugee crisis because uh, that uh, lack of democratization is accelerating conflict in, in Turkey. And, and for instance, uh, last two years, we had a big Kurdish question, but we know that in order for Turkey to deal with the refugee issue, to deal with ISIL better, there is, there is a need to have a great bargain between Turkey and Kurds, Can domestically and, and regionally. You know, so, so in this sense, I think it's more, it's, I agree with my friend that more strategic thinking, more strategic choices are, are, are necessary to make Mike. than everyday sort of a tactical approaches to these 
extremely serious okay, problems. Okay, hold, hold on to that word democracy, because in actual fact, just from the corner of my eye, I can see a question that's been submitted anonymously. I'm slightly jumping the gun here, but I couldn't resist this. Uh, whoever takes this one first, it's entirely up to you. Are the current interlinked crises exposing Europeans in brackets and much of their governance as non-democratic? Who wants to tackle that? <laughs> I'm, I'm, this, this is one I feel strongly about. Uh, I think that's, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the answer to that is a resounding no. Um, and I, I have to say, as a, as a liberal Democrat, I object resoundingly to the, um, fundamentally, to the notion of democracy espoused by Europe's populist movements, which say that the body politic is a unitarian force, yeah, and that whatever the body, body politic says is right. Yeah, that's, that's this far away from saying might makes right. And liberal democracy, representative democracy, is something entirely different. Yeah. So, um, I, in fact, what I worry about far more uh, is, is that we are making deals with autocrats, uh, with Erdogan, with Putin, with you know, potentially a host of others, uh, in order to preserve our, our little post-Kantian paradises. Is it because um, we're that, trying to preserve a paradise, or is it something called realpolitik? Better the devil well, you know. All right. but, I mean, a combination of the two, perhaps. I mean, I, I think the, the, the paradises are, are somewhat sort of less flashy looking these days. But um, <laughs> again, I, I think that we sacrifice our, legis our legitimacy as Western liber liberal democracies at our peril. That is what distinguishes us from the realm of Vladimir Putin. That is what distinguishes us from, from Recep Tayyip Erdogan. This is what gives us soft power and gives us strength. Um, and if we forego that, if we sacrifice that at the altar of expedience and making deals with autocrats, um, we essentially pull the rug out from under ourselves. Yeah, so I, I am all for Merkel so how, how, being, but how would being we, tough with Erdogan. But how would we deal with, with Erdogan? Because look, at the end of the day, he is a very important player in the refugee crisis, and, he, and well, we're, we're treating him know, as a buffer state. Look, You're there the, to contain this the, bit of humanity until we work out what to do fair, with these fair people. Enough, fair enough, and yes, we need him, and yes, he may think that he has us by the short and curlies. But, um, <laughs> sorry, I probably shouldn't say this. But, um, <clears throat> just strike that. Um, but the... <laughs> The, the reality is that he needs something from us as well. He needs validation, he needs partners, and he wants, he very much wants a visa, visa freedom for Turks. He wants to trade with us, he wants to deal with us politically. And I think, you know, we shouldn't sell ourselves cheap. Um, I, I think that that is, uh, I mean, it's worked with Putin, it seems to me. Has and it really worked? Yes, it has, absolutely. No, I think that Putin has been very unpleasantly surprised by the He's degree still of resistance. He's Crimea in spite of you EU opposition. F fair enough, but I, I can imagine that Putin thought he could do a lot more. I mean, that's why his troops are in Donbass. Um, and I think that we can see, I mean, we can probably go on to Russia, and I, could, I mean, I can certainly do chapter and verse on this, but I, but I think that withstanding uh, people like this is, is what we have to do. And um, I think in the end, there is going to be a lot of noise, uh, but, but in the end, deals will be made that are not embarrassing for us. Okay, Norbert. I mean, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, uh, firstly, I would like to say, I, I can't see that we are exposed as non- Sorry, as sorry I, thought, I thought you said you couldn't see the screen. I do apologize. Yeah, now, now I see it, yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent. As, as, as non-democratic, what, what I see is that these uh, problems and crises expose us as egocentrist, and our egocentrism leads us to stupidity. Uh, everybody tries as long as possible to turn a blind eye to a new reality, and by this, problems are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, also the Germans, when the, when the refugees were in Italy, we turned a blind eye to them and did not claim this to be identified uh, a European problem. As long as it was possible, we turned a blind eye to this situation. And the same is true. So there is no so, so, uh, uh, so uh, moral privilege uh, uh, in Germany uh, when we say we, this is a question of solidarity. Yes, uh, it is a question of solidarity, but we, we, uh, we have stated this when, when the, the refugees were in Germany. The, 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 the question, of, the question of, of how to deal with Turkey, the, the big question is, does Erdogan have an absolute priority to establish an authoritarian system in Turkey? If this is true, 
it will be very hard to come to any kind of transactional deal or to any kind of not only, and I agree very much with you, not only identifying and, and, and treating uh, uh, Turkey as a buffer zone, but to come into a closer uh, economic, cultural, political cooperation, which we now, when we face the problem of refugees, are determined to do, at least in Germany. We want to do that because now we have the problem. We missed the opportunity years ago uh, when, when Erdogan wanted to have closer uh, cooperation with us, then we did not make use of this situation. Now, this, the interests have changed and we want to seize uh, the moment. But the big question is, does Erdogan really want this or is his priority to transform the internal political system towards an authoritarian regime, which I am very much afraid of? And this makes things very, very complicated because I think there is a red line for Europeans that if a deal which would entail visa liberalization for Turkey would, um, would, would be a big, big internal success for Erdogan, and if he would make use of this in order and, and, and win a two-third majority mm -hmm. in the next elections, perhaps launch snap elections, uh, so that we enable him to, to establish this authoritarian system and regime in Turkey. I think we must not do that, and this is a red line. Well, for a, a red line for Europe, or maybe some parts of Europe, that some parts of Europe may well find a compromise, the better the devil you know, okay, we don't want to enable autocracy, but if we have to do it to dig us out of this refugee hole, then we have to look the other way. So again, we're not united. Of course, uh, the dilemma is uh, Turkey is Stay need. close to the <laughs> microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, t uh, Turkey is needed uh, to to deal with the refugee crisis, the the ISIL or or, or the, the extremism, so and so forth. But on the other hand, we have this uh, authoritarian tendency in, in in Turkey, and of course that doesn't go you know along with the European norms and everything. But although. In Europe, like Hungary, like Poland, like anywhere, we have actually many similar authoritarian uh, tendencies, and uh, you know, sort of hollowing out of the democracy, at the, you know, sort of in the name of economic stability, so and so forth. But on the other hand, there is actually a way out of doing this. That's why I think uh, I'm underlying the importance of not to look at Turkey as a buffer state. This context, for instance, 2013, there was actually a agreement between Turkey and, and the EU on, in, in terms of the visa liberalization, and this all 72 items were there. And, and Mr. Erdogan was uh, the prime minister at that time, and he signed it. Mm -hmm. But right now, uh, you know, uh, he wants to actually talk about it in a different way. Mm -hmm. I suggest to my European friends uh, this, rather than personalizing this discourse, mm -hmm talking about Erdogan all the time, all the time, as if Turkey is equal to Erdogan. Turkey is larger okay, and then bigger than, be. yes, but, but we know that Turkey is bigger and larger than anybody, even though that person has a, you know, a big, big, big power and, 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 and influence. Secondly, uh, you could actually, uh, Europe and the EU cannot say, anything about the internal debates about the regime in Turkey. It is, it is, the, it, it is a choice of Turks to be presidential, half presidential or, or, or party affiliated presidential. But, but the Europe has all the right to say about the performance of Turkey in terms of democracy, in terms of rule of law, in terms of rights and freedoms, because all of them have to do with the Copenhagen political criteria. And, and, and also, the EU and the Europe, and the, any actor in, in, in Europe, has all the right to say about Turkey in terms of the Turkey's responsibility to stick with norms and rules. If there was actually an agreement in 2013 between EU and Turkey on the basis of the acceptance of the 72 items in this liberalization, Turkey doesn't have the right to say I'm actually drilling from it, so, drifting so hold, from hold it. So, so in this sense, I actually suggest that including Germany, but all the EU friends, to actually have the discourse 
which is non-personal, which is uh, non-interfering in the domestic affairs of Turkey, but you know, sort of always promoting very loudly the, the, the importance of sticking with norms and rules. That's all EU all about, right? I mean, uh, you know, it is not a, a cultural project. It, like as Mr. Dierendorf said, there is a second Europe, which is a political Europe. And I think we are talking about Turkey, EU, we, we need to talk about Turkey relations on the base of norms, rules, rather than uh, cultural references, rather than personal, personal, personal refer references. So I actually suggest that EU can say to Turkey, look, you have to stick with the rules and norms. That's what it's all about. And this would be a way out. But of course, buffer state does not allow it. Because buffer state means to give the leverage to Turkey to do whatever it wants, you know, as long as it contains the refugees. Right, so it's that, it's that question of perception, basically. The Europe has to move away from, from the way that it, it views Turkey. So, sorry, because it's concerned so in orbit. Please, first. Only one sentence. I think this is just at the heart of our conflict, the disagreement, the relevance and validity of rules, uh, and particularly the rule of law. And he defies the validity of the rule of law and, uh, and, and, and principles. So how can you rules. be sure that if you actually try to hold him to the past, it's going to work? And the rules by nature interfere, of course, in the internal system. I'm sorry, can I, can I jump in here? Uh, I mean, the, we, this, the, there is a contradiction here that we, that it, we cannot resolve by politeness. And I think we ought to be honest enough to say that it is a contradiction and where we are going to have to stand firm which is we cannot say we insist on rules and norms and at the same time say, but we won't in interfere in your domestic affairs. Because what we are saying is that we don't want to do deals with countries that are not democratically organized, that have anti-terror laws that, in our views, violate uh, internationally recognized human rights norms, uh, and that do not or in increasingly violate the rule of law. So, and, and of course that's a normative form of interference in domestic affairs, but that, but that is, I, I would argue that we, I mean, or to recognize that we're doing that, we shouldn't be mealy-mouthed about it, but in the end, that is what we have to do, um, because we are otherwise, frankly, deserting a large swath of Turkish civil society that wants our support and wants its country to transform democratically. But we shouldn't be shy about saying that democratic transformation in our periphery, including in Turkey, is in our strategic interests. And the second point I'd like to make is we're now paying the price for a debate, uh, an EU-Turkish relationship that was, as it were, pressed into the Procrustean bed of, EU, of the EU membership process, yeah, of the, I don't know, gazillion chapters that, EU, that, that Turkey needed to wander through for it to you know, have the honor of joining us, whereas, and, and which completely prevented us from ever having an, 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 an eye-to-eye yeah, um, at, at the same level, conversation about our overlapping strategic interests in the regions and Turkey, uh, Turkey's role in that. Um, that's, that, as we now can see, is a disaster for us all. Okay, can, I, can I jump in very, very quickly? Because we've reached that point. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for reminding me of my authority. But we've reached the point in the proceedings where we actually throw open the doors to you, the audience. Now, you have been giving us some of your questions, and I've tried to feed some of them into the discussion that we've been having. Just a reminder that it is your opportunity to put questions to the panel members, or you may wish to take issue with them about something that you disagree with. You can either raise your hand. There are people around the room with the microphone. I've just seen quite a few hands go up in front of me. So you could deliver those microphones, or you can use Slido, which clearly quite a few of you have been doing. Another point as well, Norbert, I believe, will be leaving us at a quarter to seven, is that correct? We don't want you to go, but if you have to go, you have to go. Okay, so um, feel free to ask him as many questions as you can before he goes. So the lady here, could you introduce yourself, please, and put your questions to the panel? Before I take refuge. Before you take refuge, yeah, but don't take refuge just yet. So please, if you can introduce yourself. I'm sorry. It, it's on. I'm sorry, I'm not standing up. I have a laptop on my lap, sorry. So I have uh, one question to Professor Fahmi and one to Mr. Kaiman. So um, you, you talked about uh, um, preventing uh, conflicts regionally, locally. When we're talking about um, political extremism, you surely have some experience from your former work in the government of Egypt. So, um, could you share any thoughts on uh, how we could deal with um, 
the branches of brotherhood that are swapping over here to um, Europe, especially also to Germany. And um, or do you think that our soft approach towards these organizations in the regions like Daesh, for example, um, could be part of uh, the Sykes-Picot too? As we speak now in the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, not far from here, I think in that way, they are having uh, a panel whether, um, let me quote, um, whether Hezbollah and IS or whatever branch of the Brotherhood, they, they formerly had Daesh mentioned as well, uh, could be future partner in diplomacy. So I don't think that this is a naivety. I think this is a part of the plan to implement Sykes-Picot. What are your thoughts on this? Okay, so two and questions there. Que and my question to Mr. Kamen, you were talking about not making uh, the whole approach towards Turkey a, a personal issue, and Mrs. Uh, Stelzenmüller has explained that there are norms and rules that are obeyed or followed, and these criteria are exactly that are in the focus. And so I'm asking you, um, do you think that this leadership is trustworthy since there has been proof of collaborating with IS or ISIL, as you call it. Okay, can we get the, Thank you. the response to that from Nabil Fami? Because you've got two questions to answer there. Sure. Uh, they're very complicated questions. We're all, all of us who want to be inclusive <coughs> find this tension between where do we draw the line between freedom of ideas, freedom of expression, and policies that are simply unacceptable with our system of government, per se. And that, frankly, is what's happened in the Middle East. Uh, you mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood. Others will mention others. Uh, let me give you the Egyptian ex experience. Uh, between 2011 and 2013, the Muslim Brotherhood was legal in Egypt, and the President Morsi was elected. Uh, so we tried that experience. Uh, the challenge to Morsi first came from the liberals in Egypt, not from the military. It came from the liberals, essentially, from the National Salvation Group. And the reason they did that is they felt that the Muslim Brotherhood, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, felt that Egypt was part of the Brotherhood, not that the Brotherhood was part of Egypt. So e Egypt's identity was being changed as being part of the Muslim Brotherhood, rather than we may disagree with the Muslim Brotherhood, but they're part of Egypt, so then they have the right and freedom. Uh, my answer to you is, for, I think our boundary has to be, if any organization accepts the nation state system and accepts to work within the nation state system uh, with our respective constitutions uh, as they may be, then they have to be given the, the, the right to participate. If, on the other hand, they don't want to accept that nation state system, then obviously they're trying to break the system. And they're trying to do it in a violent fashion rather than in an uh, in, in intellectual fashion. And that's really where the, the, the challenge comes. I don't yet think, and, and if you follow what's been happening now in the Muslim Brotherhood throughout the Middle East, different rumors about who wants to break away from the Brotherhood in Tunis, for example, and only be a party rather than part of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, network as a whole, it's not clear uh, where they are on this. So my, my, my answer to on this point is, as of now, particularly in my country, there is tremendous suspicion that this is just a maneuver and that they still want to make the country part of the Brotherhood, and that's something which simply we can't, we can't accept. You have to be serious and critical in how you listen to these ideas. Because again, leave the Brotherhood aside for a second. Let's just leave them aside for a second. If you look at 9-11, what happened in 9-11 were Arabs training in Afghanistan, networking and planning in Europe, including in Germany, and then attacking North America. 
So the idea that as long as they don't violate our laws, it's acceptable, is something which it's a very gray area which we have to respect, but we have to be we shouldn't be naive about. And I argue the same thing, and I'm sorry it takes too long, but 2013 to 14, I was foreign minister, and I remember being in Brussels, and our security people were telling us the number of people coming from Belgium to ISIS is way beyond what is logical. So I was sitting with the, with the Belgian foreign minister, and I said, my friend, careful here, because if our figures are right, this doesn't make sense, given your population. And his answer at the time was, they're a kilometer and a half away from where we're sitting. And he told me, this is exactly where they are. But they weren't taking the issue itself seriously enough that it actually would affect them. It was still something that was affecting us in the region. These things don't, one, one can't be ruthless, but you can't be naive. Uh, on the, the uh, Sykes-Picot thing, first of all, Sykes-Picot actually never kept their promise to anybody because what they, they didn't keep their promise to the Arabs. Sorry? Well, I'm not sure we have Sykes-Picot too yet. Uh, so uh, the first thing is they didn't keep their promise. Secondly, the stability that we have today as, as an Arab, we always criticize Sykes-Picot. Now we don't want anybody to change Sykes-Picot because the, the idea of changing it is just more uh, tumultuous than, li than living with it. I worry that the region is, is, is being pushed to be re redefined on an ethnic, sectarian, and religious basis rather than, rather than a national state basis. And that would, sure, I, I know, but I mean, look, I come from the region, believe me, we have thousands of theories about who's conspiring, and we have a lot of names for them. So uh, <laughs> the, the point really is, if you break the nation state system, and if this confirms your point, if you break that, we're going to be in serious trouble, and you will be as well. But we can't afford not to transform it, because we need to create a better, uh, social contract with our different constituencies so that they find satisfaction in their own citizenship within our own systems. Now, but we need to work together because in a global environment, as, as my colleague said, I can't control money, I can't control ideas, I can't control uh, refugee, and I can't, frankly, prevent people from moving in and out. So this has to be a, 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 a process which at least the neighboring regions work together and even more so, even, even on, a, on a global level. Okay, Thank you. Can, can we now go to, to Fuad Kamen, because you, you had a question there. Very briefly, uh, I mean, Turkish uh, foreign policy or Turkish uh, leadership uh, has made a number of mistakes, uh, a number of actually uh, strategic mistakes in, in, in uh, foreign policy in recent years. But, uh, you know, uh, for instance, uh, Turkey-Egypt relations, uh, we need uh, better Turkey-Egypt relations right now to deal with these problems. Turkey-Israel relations, uh, I was involved in these debates, but uh, you know, we need normalization between Turkey and Israel. That would be better for the, for, 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 for the region, dealing with the question of ISIL and, 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 and ex extremism. Uh, and uh, Turkey's uh, break uh, with, with the uh, peace process uh, and, and this actually great grant a bargain with, with, with Kurds and r you know, rather than uh, you know peaceful negotiations to deal with the Kurdish issue now we have a very ex accelerated you know a conflict between between Turkey and and uh, PKK uh, so these are the mistakes but uh, you know I do not believe I never believed and I do not believe that Turkey and Turkish state you know has intentionally uh, sort of eased up on uh, ISIL and, and, and had some relations with, 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 IS, uh, with, with, with ISIL. Uh, because Turkey has been extremely uh, you know, hurt and damaged by, by ISIL's uh, terrorist attacks in, in the southeast, in, in Ankara, in Istanbul, in, in Anatolia. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, when you look at the uh, numbers, uh, Turkish uh, you know, uh, people uh, are the number one in the ranking uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, uh, like them, sort of the casualties and and those who got killed by 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 the ISIS. So I I do not uh, I do not uh, uh, believe in that. If Turkey had a good relation with the uh, with the Kurds, 
Turkey had actually continued to the, the, the peace process, uh, it would have better off uh, in terms of its position on ISIL. If Turkey had a good relation with, with Egypt, it would have better, you know, it, it would have a better position right now in, in dealing, dealing, dealing with with, uh, with ISIL. Uh, I expect after uh, I, I don't like actually sort of talking about the, the leader of Turkey in terms of whether that person or any leader of any country, whether it is trustworthy or whatever. But, but on the other hand, uh, you know, uh, we could actually go for uh, two ways because we know that. This is actually objective knowledge. You don't actually be Turkish or, or, or European or, or, or Ger Germany. And when we look at Turkey from outside or, or from inside, there is one leader, there is fusion of power, and there is actually a big move for presidentialism. So for instance, for Norway, you, you, Germany is going to deal with Erdogan. And then you will deal with Erdogan because he will be the fused, uh, fu he will be the uh, actor, the only actually actor. But the question actually is not whether or not we trust Erdogan, but what kind of uh, you know tragic, what kind of position he will have afterwards? Because finally he got what he wanted. He is the actually center uh, in terms of the governance governance of, of Turkey. Most likely uh, towards the end of the year, Turkey will be either uh, affiliated party, affiliated presidential system, or or half presidential system. So so he did actually this successfully. I mean, I don't like it because I'm a parliament, the, the democracy person, but, but he actually successfully did this move to regime change, towards regime okay. change. But because he's pragmatic, so he could be actually uh, uh, go for uh, better relations with, with Egypt, he would go for normalization with, with Israel, he would go for like better relations with the EU in the name of uh, bringing together economic, you know, uh, developmentalism with, uh, with presiden presidentialism, or we have, this is a good scenario. I or or we had a bad scenario, would be, would be actually to Turkey would be very introverted and would be very confrontational. But okay, that would actually be not good, bad for Turkey, but bad for the region. Okay, can I, can I jump in? Because I'd, I'd like to take a few more questions from the floor, but also in the time we have for the debate to integrate some of the questions that have been coming through from Slido and also take a look at some juncture of the uh, questions, the question which I put to you at the beginning, which uh, our audience has been responding to. Now, there's a lady over there. Yep, the lady in the red shirt. So if you could introduce yourself and keep your question brief, please. My name is Lisa Hafalach, and I'm um, a research associate here for the Darndorf Forum. Um, concerning the partnerships that you've been uh, talking about with authoritarian leaders, I was wondering whether this sort of new, um, new world order, if it's not striking that the West is seemingly still dependent, actually, for both its political and its economic system, to, to a sort of old colonial formula in which liberal values are kept at home, but um, in the periphery, a hidden illiberalism is still sustained. And um, whether that accepts um, this acceptance of illiberalism abroad uh, for short-term goals is not something that we have already seen has dire consequences in the past. And in the example of Turkey, I think we can see also that um, this partnership will likely also have very serious consequences for the country's democracy in the years to come. So I wanted to ask whether you think there's an alternative in the political and economic system that we have today to this quite strict um, differentiation in the way that we deal with uh, democratic democratization in, and illiberalism in the system here and okay. in the periphery. Thank okay, you. Norbert, would you like to tackle that? I think we can't, can't speak of, of, of an attitude of acceptance of illiberalism. What we do is exactly the opposite of that. And, and the strategic foundations of our European foreign policy laid down in 2003 says that the only sustainable way of having a stable neighborhood which we are dependent on is by developing uh, values, European values, which, is, which consist of the rule of law, uh, civil rights and so on, and democracy. So this is, this is the, the, the conceptual basis of our European policy. But we have to face reality, and now the situation has changed in so far that we have obvious interests. To regain control about huge numbers of refugees coming to Europe in a situation when Europe is not able to give a common response to this shaking 
challenge. This has changed our strength. This makes the, the, the European disunity, of course, causes weakness and vulnerability. And I would at least raise the question that it is legitimate to uh, apply the, the tool of visa freedom as an instrument to pursue our interests. So far, as laid down in the, in the European rules, uh, visa freedom has been um, identified and conceptualized as a tool of European education abroad. So if you develop in a European way, you are awarded with visa freedom. Fine and excellent. But now, since we have interests uh, in our international relations, I raise the question if visa freedom may be allowed to be used as a tool of pursuing legitimate European interests. And this may be perhaps a change in our relationship to our neighbourhood. So the visa is the key to it. Constanza, would you like to respond to that? I think my answer to that last question is yes. Sure, I mean, sure, it's, it's, I mean it's, honestly, it's in the same way that we used sanctions to express our extreme disapproval yes. towards Russia, and that had consequences for the Russian economy. But this also yeah. is a new invention. Yeah. We haven't done this in, in the end. It's not, oh, seriously, it's not a new invention. Um, I mean, honestly, we always had the tool. We were just reluctant to use it. Vis-a-vis -vis Russia, it's an absolute in uh, 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 yes, was, uh, that's what I'm saying. The tool was there, we were reluct reluctant to use it, and we were forced to make a choice between our own, our own norms, our own ideals, what we stand for. Yeah. Yeah. And frankly, that would have been a too high price to pay, hence, hence we went for sanctions. And surprise, surprise, and I think it was frankly a big surprise to a lot of the foreign ministries in Europe, it worked, it had an impact. Mm -hmm. So I suggest that we stay tough on, 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 on Turkey. Um, again, they know they need us, we need them, and there is a deal to be made, but not at any price. End on. The, the gentleman over there, because he's been extraordinarily patient, so thank you for that. Could you introduce yourself and keep the question brief, please? Yeah. Andreas Umland from the Institute of, for Euro-Atlantic Cooperation in Kiev. And I'm sort of asking also from the um, direction of, of, of Ukraine. And again, I'm asking here about Turkey, and I agree very much that Turkey is a, is a key country, but there's going to be tomorrow a working session on EU-Turkey relations and a panel on the joint uh, action agreement. So I want to touch a, another aspect of Turkish foreign policy, namely the Black Sea region, where we had two major power shifts uh, in the last two years with the annexation of Crimea and the confrontation between um, uh, Turkey and, and Russia. And my question goes, of course, first of all to Professor Kayman, but maybe also to uh, uh, Dr. Sorotkin and, and Stelzenmüller. So my question is basically, is the current uh, tension between Turkey and Russia an interregnum, or is it going, going to stay? And is the current rapprochement between Turkey and Ukraine something that will lead to something, or is it maybe also just a, a phase? So we have, of course, a, a lot of economic interests on the side of Turkey regarding um, uh, Russia. There are the Volga Tatars. There are, there's some commonality of interests in, in Central Asia, per, perhaps. But there are lots of, of problems in the Turkish-Russian relations, Azerbaijan, the Crimean Tatars, Syria, the sort of Putin-Erdogan antipathy, um, Crimea militarization, and we have on the, other, on, the, on the other side a sort of almost every other week a new sort of Ukrainian-Turkish uh, initiative, like the 21-point declaration between Poroshenko and Erdogan, the uh, uh, Antonov plane uh, production plans, the, um, the military hospitals, Turkish mil military hospitals in Ukraine, and so on. So could that lead to either a bilateral closer relationship between Turkey and, um, and Ukraine, maybe even involving a treaty like that between Turkey and Azerbaijan about strategic partnership, or could even the trilateral consultations between Poland, um, uh, Romania and Turkey within, within NATO at some point include uh, Ukraine? Okay, brief. <laughs> I would answer that that mainly the cause for uh, the, the downfall in the uh, Russian-Turkish relationship was an accident. It was a one-off event. It was uh, the, the confrontation between uh, 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 the, the airplanes. 
But given the nature, <coughs> given this, the relatively similar nature of the two leaders of Russia and Turkey, this is going to be a very durable clash between the both countries, both of the countries. So my expectation is that this has for some time uh, deteriorated the political relations between the two countries and Turkey is suffering a lot economically from that. On the other side, I do not see really a viable, substantive, new relationship between uh, Ukraine and uh, Turkey, which uh, would end in, in a substantive economic, political support from Turkey to Ukraine. And this is because Ukraine is really a very, very complicated case. It requires and it deserves the support of those who see Ukraine as a case for itself, but, all, but also at the same time a case which stands for uh, the liberal uh, European peace, or, uh, uh, peace order in Europe. And for this, uh, we, we, we are determined to support Ukraine, but Ukraine has to do its homework, and this is mainly to more convincingly, effectively fight the corruption in the country. Can I, can I come, come in just on the back of that? I mean, you have a depth of knowledge about Turkish-Ukrainian relations that I couldn't hope to respond to. But I will say that I think it's sort of dodgy for us um, to contemplate giving visa freedom to the Turks and not to the Ukrainians. Uh, given that there is a degree of uh, will to self-transform going on in Ukraine and a very energetic civil society in Ukraine um, that I think we need to not just pay attention to but respect. So um, I think if we do one, we, we, I think, perhaps expose ourselves a little bit uh, under, you know, idealistic and realpolitik questions if, if we don't do the other. Uh, and finally, on the point of corruption that Norman Redkin just raised, um, I I'd, I'd like to illustrate this as a, or use this as an illustration of the complicity problem. One of the reasons that civil society in Kiev is so angry is because it thinks that we are complicit with the oligarchs who have a firm tentacular stranglehold on democratic transformation in that country, which is the difference between democratic transformation process currently going on in Ukraine and what happened in Poland 20 years ago. Um, and uh, one of the problems with that, I would say, is that those oligarchs, in the same way as Russian oligarchs, bunker a lot of assets, including money, in Europe. And I think if we're not willing uh, to lay open those money streams and, and in fact to name and shame, uh, then we are at some risks of not just exposing ourselves as being complicit, but of defeating what has to be a strategic uh, goal for us, which is making sure that the process in Ukraine doesn't founder and doesn't become a sinkhole. Okay. Can we just break away from the panel for the moment? Because if it's possible, can we animate to that poll this is the request to the technical guys at the back of the room, because if you remember, we had the question, which I put at the very beginning, what will be Europe's biggest foreign policy challenge in the next 10 years? 41% of you saying failed states, 32% migration, global poverty, 18%, climate change, 16%. Interestingly, Russia, 11%. So failed states, the priority. Can I get the reaction of the panel? But first, Norbert, I know that you're very time sensitive as your plane is waiting for you on the runway as we speak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. <laughs> but but, but my, my answer as a politician is that you can't neither intellectually nor politically separate these things. And so all answers are right, and we have to treat uh, and to cope with all these challenges at the same time. So we have a new simultaneousness of crises. This is my answer. So we, we've, made the, we've made a big mistake. We've actually seen, seen you know, everything I separately. I reiterate <laughs> that you made a mistake, but I want to underline that there is this simultaneousness. When, if I may, may just give an example, when, when ISIS took Mosul, the second biggest uh, uh, um, city in, in Iraq. The, the more or less official response in Berlin was, we do not have, what is this, this ugly terror organization? We, we do not have the resources to deal with this organization because we are completely occupied with the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. So we have to really to adapt to a new reality of the simultaneousness or simultaneity of, 
of crises, this is the only thing I want to say. Okay, then. Can I and get I want to say that I really enjoyed to take part in this And discussion. we certainly enjoyed having, having you on the panel. Thank you yeah, so much for your contribution. You. Excellent. <laughs> Norbert Rodgen, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can I get your reaction to that poll, Constanza? 41% saying that the priority should be failed states. <laughs> Well, um, I feel the same way as Norbert Rutkin, that, that um, it's difficult to keep these things apart. I mean, I mean, we know that people migrate because they're poor as well, and not just because of political persecution, and because climate change creates, you know, devastates their, 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 their societies, their agriculture, and so on. I also would like to raise a larger and perhaps slightly more um, controversial point, which is um, that, you know, Russia is a fairly well-organized and strong state, but it is exhibiting some symptoms which you could see as harbing as a failure uh, for the simple reason that its economy is based on one thing alone. And in fact, the Russian leadership has failed to diversify, although they know, I mean, they were planning to and they want and, and the oil and gas. And yeah, exactly. And uh, oil and gas income these days isn't what it used to be. Um, and you see a already sort of symptoms of not political fragmentation, but of a sort of loss of, of grip, I think, by the, by the leadership that goes a fairly long way to explaining some of the external ex aggression we've seen in the last 18 months. So, and, and again, I'm, I'm saying this without any, any kind of, I don't want to be judgmental, I don't want to be, uh, you know, I don't want to be a doomsayer, and I also want to say that state failure is something that um, is possible in Europe itself. We are certainly seeing a number of states, including our own, being completely overwhelmed um, by, the, by handling the number of crises that we're experiencing now at the same time. And this, what, what I would call this überforderung, or if, if you want an English word, systems overload that we're seeing is something that's really quite dangerous. And, and I think that we are gonna have to do something about if we want to make sure that we grapple with this successfully. Okay, can I get the reaction of uh, Nabu Fahmi and Fuat Kamen to the results so far on that poll very quickly, and then we'll take some more questions. Well, it, sorry, it's a, it's a typical European reaction because for Europeans, they would look at migration and failed states with the same sense of concern and insecurity. So that's why you have the top two, them as the top two. Uh, if you asked other regions, they will probably deal with other issues, not uh, failed states, but by migration. So I'm not surprised by, by this result today. Th three years ago, you may not have gotten uh, that result. Again, one of the strengths of Europe is also one of its weaknesses. Its strengths in, in trying, in, in, in that it has well-established democratic systems. Democratic systems are difficult to manage and they are driven by politics that tend to be short-term because politicians are held accountable by elections in a relatively short period of time. You are therefore then always asked, do I make a choice between principle and what, how do I solve the immediate problem today? There's no clear answer. I would never argue that you need to ignore principle because then you're changing who you are. Sure. But I, it's naive to assume that you will stand on principle on every issue all the time. That's not going to happen. Therefore, you need to have strategic policies, not tactical ones. Okay. Can I get your thoughts on this, Fuat Kim, and to that result? And then afterwards, we'll take some questions from uh, Slido. Uh, then, uh, I should be more European than uh, <laughs> Turkish because uh, that would be my ranking too. Uh, failed states, uh, migration or refugee, global poverty, climate change. Uh, rather than Russia, I would put uh, their uh, violence, uh, <coughs> terrorism and uh, war, uh, because I think we have a very serious question about violence against women, violence against, uh, you know, in all these forms and different uh, asymmetric wars, proxy wars and everything. So, so in this sense, uh, I think uh, one of the, uh, <coughs> there are very serious research uh, going on on the issue of violence because some suggest that uh, the violence turns out to be the the pillar of, of, of security concerns in, in these years and the years years to come but uh, I, I would agree with these okay then let's move it back to the questions if we can just disappeared <laughs> <laughs> they were there a second ago okay the world has become oops <laughs> 
I think they said the world has become more interconnected. And there was something else which followed that. But look, whilst we're waiting, there it is. The world has become more interconnected and complex. What difference does that make in a world that is ruled by political short-term considerations anyway, which you've actually touched on to a certain extent? But would anyone else like to add to that before we move on to another question here, which I've spotted? Or should I move on to another question? What would you like to say? All right. I mean, since we're being asked the questions, we might as well get, you know, give it a shot. Uh, so on this one, I would say the... Answer to that is not to 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 c confine ourselves to or to uh, l lower our level of ambition. In other words, to say that we will be short-termist, we will be tactical, and we will manage and be reactive because that's as good as it's going to get. Uh, I think we've done we've seen a lot of that we, because we've been doing that, and we can see that that's disastrous because it locks us into path dependencies that then lead to negative outcomes that are not in our strategic interests. Um, what I do see, and I presume that those of you who talk to policymakers relatively regularly will, will know that they complain about being pulled into a, a sort of a, a world where everything they do is 24-7 crisis management. And this is true even for the people who in foreign ministries and chancelleries are supposed to be doing strategy and are, uh, or, or forecasting and are supposed to be doing the big thinking, you know, beyond the horizon sort of stuff. So what I suggest is that you, I think you, we have to resist this, both uh, in the sort of analytical academia slash think tank world, but also in the world of policymakers. There has to be a space, and there have to be people who are not just allowed to do the, the, the connecting the dots, but who are allowed to resist if people try to pull them into the other stuff. I think that that's a really crucial point because without <coughs> thinking big, you're never going to you're never going to es escape these these constraints. Okay, if you're at King, then. You know, uh, maybe we should actually put to this uh, question of long-term, uh, you know, visions versus short-sighted uh, leadership or, or approach uh, in a different form uh, in terms of uh, our. Uh, during the uh, 1990s, 2000s, our belief that uh, globalization, interconnectedness, interdependencies coming with globalization will solve certain problems. And then right now, there is a growing, uh, you know, uh, skepticism about about the way that globalization uh, operating. And, and I think the American elections is quite illustrative in that context because both uh, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, you know, gain amazingly fast popularity because of their actually harsh criticism of globalization, especially in terms of trade. And they take a very nationalist position that they say that if we actually had this actually from a political economy uh, point of view, we will be talking about how to slow down globalization, how to control globalization. We used to believe that globalization involves you know, both potentials and, and, and risks, and certain countries that are articulating potentials will be successful. But right now, we are not talking about the potentials of globalization. We are talking about extremely significant risks coming from globalization. So I think uh, uh, globalization versus nationalism, globalization versus, you know, uh, sort of a new political discourse that, that this sort of promotes a national uh, strength vis-a-vis -vis this fast-going globalization or interconnectedness will be the, uh, you know, new uh, way of, uh, you know, governance. And, and I think uh, in that sense, uh, Turkey is not the only case. We are actually a number of cases where this critic of globalization through nationalist point of view will create a new form of new type of populisms, authoritarianisms, or what some Harvard uh, scholars uh, suggest competitive authoritarianism may be actually the form that we will be dealing with politics. In okay, the time is running very, very tight. So in the minutes that we have available, I'm going to take one more question. I also want you all to respond to it very briefly. The one underneath, with migration flows and conflict in the Middle East absorbing most of Europe's attention, are we at risk of ignoring larger global trends and challenges? Very briefly, Constanza. I think that's uh, definitely a risk, um, but it's one that we, I, I, I think the, the lesson of the current time is that we go, don't get to pick and choose. Yeah? We may have to prioritize, but we, we are not allowed to let uh, issues drop off the back burner. In other words, we, I think for the, in the short to medium term, are going to have to look towards stability and peace and prosperity and transformation at home, meaning in Europe, 
and our own countries and in the region, and that will be more than enough, more than enough for us at this point. But at the same time, uh, we would be, it would be very unwise if we lost sight of what's happening uh, in China and in China's neighborhood. Um, the Brits and the French certainly have very well figured out strategic interests there. And so I would suggest do the Germans, uh, given the amount of trade that we have with China. Our, be our bet on Chinese stability and the Chinese role in the world is very, very large indeed. And we stand to lose a great deal if that bet go so it goes south. So I think um, we need to develop a larger sense of the world. The other thing that I'd like to mention, very, very briefly, are, yes, so that just one, one final word. point. We also, of course, have a strategic interest in global order and in what I would call, as a trained international lawyer, uh, common domains of mankind. Yeah? We have to, these are becoming increasingly contested in cyberspace, on the high seas, the deep seas, uh, in space and elsewhere. And these areas need to be re-regulated in such a way that we can all have access to them. Germany has a very long tradition of contributing to international law and international legal thinking, originally and creatively, and I think that that's something we shouldn't leave out. Okay, Fuad came very briefly. Very briefly. Uh, the last day's discussion will be titled to Europe 2020. I would say, actually, the refugee crisis and the uh, failed state slash ISIL crisis will consume all of our energies. And I think uh, uh, we have uh, some success in defeating ISIL. The impact of ISIL will be, con be continuing until 2020. But I totally agree uh, with Constance that, that, that uh, even if uh, we are actually focusing exclusively on refugee crisis and the ISIL crisis, we have to have some sort of vision towards, co you know, much better global order. Okay, and Nabil Fahmi, very briefly. In, address in addressing the last two questions, I'm going to suggest something that I don't expect to happen, but I think it's important that it happens. Present day leaders will be, will be unable to isolate themselves from short term political pressures. So I don't expect them to be comprehensive and strategic all the time. My suggestions, therefore, is have to have somebody else to do that. Now, who are the potential leaders who can possibly do that? But Again, I draw a, a point of caution. New Secretary General of the UN, the head of regional organizations, be they in Europe, in, in, for in the Middle East, for the Arab world, for example, these are positions that should be taken on by people who are ready to project their vision, what they believe is right and wrong, without being responsible to an immediate constituency. Now, I know that's not where we are, but frankly, it's actually in this era of complex challenges, of globalization, of having to take decisions immediately. We're all pushed not to be strategic, not to look at the bigger picture, not to remind people. So I actually think that international, the leaders of organizations or regional ones can play a role here that they haven't played for some time now. In each one of our organizations, each one of them, in Europe, in my part of the world, or even internationally, you go back, the beginning, and you say they were the leaders, and today they're much weaker. Why? Why can't that happen again? Okay. So we are coming to the end of this session. I think you can all sense that. But before we part company, I'm going to invite the remaining members of the panel to give a very short concluding statement addressing that theme, Europe and the world, global insecurity and power shifts. Who'd like to draw the short straw? <laughs> <laughs> to which I say, Fuat came and go to it. A very brief statement addressing this theme. Europe and the world, global insecurity and power shifts. <laughs> I mean, difficult, but uh, you know, uh, I always, when I talk about European integration, uh, I always go back to Jean Monnet. And then Jean Monnet's, uh, you know, the last pages of, of, of his work where he says the global, in the European project is not only very, very important project for, for Europe, but for, but for the world. And, 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 and we need actually Europe to be engaging in a much better and effective way with, with this uh, regional and, 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 and global challenges. But in that context, uh, I suggest that, uh, like uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski always suggested, a, a sort of an enlarged Europe, 
larger Europe uh, in which the transatlantic cooperation is strong and also by taking Turkey, Turkey in should behave strategically, make uh, strategic uh, st cho choices to deal with the, these, uh, the, these, these, these problems. And, and, uh, and I think uh, Europe, although it is inwarded, although internally shaken and everything, but extremely crucial actor for the uh, you know, possible global order and peace. Excellent, thank you. Fuat Kamen, very, very briefly, your reaction to the theme or the concluding remarks to that theme, Europe and the world, global insecurity and power shifts. Oh, I beg your pardon. I do beg your pardon. Nabil Fahmi, okay. I do beg your pardon. You can go again later. Well, very, very simply, I would have said Europe in the world, rather Europe and the world, because you're part of the world. Secondly, <laughs> <laughs> well, my second point is this is a win-win or lose-lose situation. Either we work together and all benefit in different degrees, if we don't work together, we're all going to face the, the implications of global insecurity. And, and our, our colleague also, before he left, was correct in saying, even how we define power, and if you, if you look at how power is defined many, many years ago, it's a completely different concept. Now we're competing with power with individuals in the street and multinationals and globalization. So it's, a lot of, it's much more complicated. We, can't, we cannot deal with this as if it is it's Europe, and then the Middle East is separate, and then Asia is separate, and, 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 the, and the North America is separate. So again, win, win, or lose, lose. Make okay. your choice. And Constanza. And I'm assuming you're not going to get let me have Norbert Rutgen's time as well. That's all right. Don't worry. No, um, well, he, he's gone, two, I'm afraid. He took his time with two him. Very, two very <laughs> brief points. Uh, one on the insecurity. I think we have to accept that the Cold War, while I'm not inclined to romanticize it, it was no fun at the time, uh, was a historical anomaly for Europe. Um, the stability that we experienced at the time, and that particularly Germany experienced through NATO and EU enlargement, thereby surrounding itself with a very big, fat buffer of stability, prosperity, and peace. That period is over, and we are now, for the foreseeable future, going to have to live with insecurity. That means we are going to have to find out whether liberal and open democracies can live under, under these conditions and successfully defend their values. That means investing in resilience at all levels. I think that's going to be a fairly tough challenge. On the point of the power shifts, I agree, and I think it was Norbert Redken who said that, um, you know, it's not clear that we are looking at alternate poles of power towards whom power is shifting. The real phenomenon that we're dealing with is that power, the phenomenon of particularly of nation state power is frittering away, and that states, even strong and powerful nation states, are losing control over outcomes, and thereby are finding themselves in a situation where they, you know, the best they can hope to do is pretty much we stay on the Bronco and not, and not be thrown off. That, I think, again, is too low a level of ambition, uh, but we may have to look at the design of our systems if we want to avoid the systems overload that we're seeing now. Okay. Nabil Fami, Fuad Kiman, and Constance Stoltzmuller, thank you so much for your contribution to the Darren Dawson Symposium. <laughs>